Here is uh, what problems can be efficiently verified by interacting with two uh, quantum entangled provers. Okay. Uh, so, you know, somewhat remarkably, there's a, a connection between these. So, so the connection is that a yes answer to this con embedding question uh, implies a computable upper bound on this complexity class MIP star. Um, and our, our main result is to show that MIP star is equal to RE, the set of recursively enumerable languages which uh, means that there is no computable upper bound. Uh, and therefore, the answer to this uh, operator algebra's question is, is no. Okay. So, so in this talk, I, I, you know, I'll spend most of the time talking about what the connection is between these two questions, um, you know, between the con embedding problem, uh, quantum information, uh, and computation. Uh, so it covers a lot of different topics, and, uh, but I uh, will try my best not to assume knowledge of, uh, you know, any background knowledge in, say, quantum information or, or much complexity theory. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about the connection, and then, and then once we establish that, I'll, I'll try to say something about how uh, we prove this uh, uncomputability result of non-local games using this technique called recursive compression. Uh, and then, you know, if there's some time left, I'll, I'll try to give a glimpse of, of how this compression technique works. Okay, so, so I'm going to start off with uh, something called non-local games. Um, and, uh, you know, these things are tests for correlations between two separated physical systems. Okay. So uh, what do I mean by correlations? Well, it's, it's some mathematical model of the input and output behavior of two spatially separated uh, boxes. Okay. So think of these two boxes uh, as being uh, placed very far away from each other. They, they can't send signals. Um, and uh, you know, these boxes, we just uh, interact with them through their input and output behavior. So these boxes take inputs, say x and y. Uh, something happens inside these boxes, uh, and out comes uh, some outputs, a and b. Uh, and we can model uh, their behavior via something called a correlation. And this is a conditional probability distribution that says if these two boxes get inputs x and y, then they have some probability of producing a and b. And to sort of model the, the, the fact that these two boxes are placed very far apart, and you know, they, we assume that they can't signal to each other, uh, this correlation has to satisfy some non-signaling constraint. So for example, if you look at the marginal probability that these two boxes produce output A on the left-hand side, it should only depend on the input to the left box. Right? So the probability of A, given x and y, should only depend on x. Okay. Uh, and, and there's a symmetric condition for the other box. So, so we're interested in these types of correlations. And uh, you can ask, well, what types of correlations are allowed in, in nature? And this depends on uh, your model of physics, right? So what, what physics do you believe in? So if you believe in classical physics, uh, you know, there's uh, a class of correlations, um, the simplest one being uh, deterministic correlations, where these boxes, that their outputs that they produce are, are just a function of the inputs that they receive. Okay? So that's uh, a deterministic correlation. Uh, and then classical correlations, uh, we define them to be convex combinations of all deterministic ones. Okay. Right, so uh, these are sort of uh, the types of correlations that classical physics say can arise between these two separated boxes. Um, but we, we think we live in a, a, not a classical universe, but a quantum one. And there, uh, there's a different description of what goes on between um, these two boxes. So quantum physics says uh, one possibility is that these two boxes can share uh, two particles that live in some quantum entangled state. And when the boxes receive their inputs, they perform some measurement on their particles, and they get some measurement outcomes, which they report. And mathematically, we can describe this uh, using the following uh, formalism. So let's imagine that each of these particles uh, are some D-level systems, right? So you make a measurement and you get one of D possible outcomes. Um, so uh, the state of each particle by themselves can be, you know, represented as some vector in C to the D. 
But when you, in quantum mechanics, when you talk about the composite system as a whole, you think of, you know, the way to describe the state of these two entangled particles is to consider unit vectors that live in the tensor product of these two spaces. Uh, and so that, this psi here denotes the state of these two particles. Um, and to describe the probabilities of obtaining different measurements, uh, it's given by these things called POVMs. These are positive operators that, uh, so this box here has operators that uh, act on this space. Uh, this box here has operators that act on this space. And there's a formula for describing the joint probability uh, distribution of outcomes, right? It's, it's, it's given by this formula here. It's not so important to know uh, what exactly it means. Um, but um, it's just, uh, just note that uh, the probabilities are given by uh, these operators acting on uh, the state. Okay. Okay, so this is the, the mathematical prescription of uh, what uh, you know, quantum mechanics tells us can happen between these two uh, devices. Um, Uh, yes, so there, there is some, so if you fix an x, if you fix an input, then the operators uh, a, x, a for all a sum up to identity. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and they're positive operators. Which is a bit equivalent to like if you have a question x and you, you give each answer some probability, the probability sum to one. Exactly, yeah. Um, So you won't uh, you know, need to necessarily remember this formula, but uh, that, that's uh, what quantum mechanics tells us. Um, okay. So uh, you know, back in the 30s, um, actually right here at IAS, uh, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen were thinking about the types of correlations that arise from this formula that uh, uh, you just saw. And um, you know, famously, Einstein was, was very bothered by the types of uh, correlations that seemed to come out. And he, he called them very spooky. And uh, I guess at the time, they hoped that maybe there's some classical explanation of the types of correlations that could come out. Um, but 30 years later, uh, Jean Bell gave a very uh, sort of powerful answer and said, actually, there is no classical explanation for these spooky correlations. And he gave a very simple uh, demonstration through this thought experiment uh, uh, that sort of explains why. And uh, sort of, um, he, he didn't put it in this terms, but this is sort of like a modern uh, reformulation of what uh, Bell showed. So he c came up with this thing called you know, a game. And uh, this game we're going to talk about is called the CHSH game. Uh, and uh, in this game, you know, there's these two devices that have this quantum entangled state between them. Uh, and let's call the, the boxes provers, okay? sort of to coincide with uh, terminology we'll use later. And these uh, provers are interacting with the verifier. And the verifier is trying to tell, uh, is there some classical explanation for the behavior of these, uh, these two provers? And the provers are trying to convince the verifier that no, we actually were behaving non-classically. So how do they uh, convince the verifier of this? Well, in this game, the verifier will choose two inputs, x and y, which are um, random bits. It sends x to one of the provers, y to the other prover. And uh, the provers perform some strategy. They use some correlation. Okay? They produce outputs uh, according to some p of a, b given x, y. They generate these two uh, outputs, a and b, which are bits. And the verifier accepts if the sum of the two bits is equal to the and of their input bits. Okay? So this is the CHSH game. Uh, and uh, we can ask, well, what is the maximum success probability of the, the two provers uh, in this game? So according to uh, classical physics, if these two devices were behaving classically, they were using classical strategies, uh, then their classical value, which we'll denote by omega sub c of this game, is 3 quarters. Okay, this is uh, easily achieved by you know, the, the box is always outputting 0, for example. Um, but it turns out that uh, uh, using uh, a quantum strategy, 
by using some uh, quantum entangled state, they can have a, a higher winning probability. So the quantum value of this game, uh, which we'll denote uh, using omega q, is um, uh, a number that's strictly higher. It's 0.854. Okay. And uh, this, uh, this optimum uh, winning probability in the quantum case is achieved using a very simple quantum strategy. These uh, two devices share what's called an EPR pair, just two qubits. It's described by this four-dimensional state. Um, and they use some very simple measurements. Uh, and they can achieve this advantage over classical strategies. OK, so, uh, so the nice thing about this uh, CHSH game is that it gives a very simple experimental test of non-classicality. Right? And, and this is actually an experiment that um, physicists have conducted over the years. Um, so this is a, a picture of actually a CHSH experiment that was performed maybe five years ago. Um, and uh, this is the campus of uh, Delft, uh, uh, TU Delft in, in the ne Netherlands. And um, here, two devices were put about uh, over a kilometer apart. They shared some uh, quantum entangled state. They played the CHSH game. And they verified uh, that the, these uh, boxes were winning with probability strictly greater than uh, 3 quarters. Okay. And that tells you that they couldn't have been behaving um, classically, and our best explanation for their behavior is, is through quantum mechanics. Okay, so. What's the significance of these numbers being meters? Oh, right. So I guess you want to put the boxes far away enough so that they don't have time to, to send signals between each other. So you measure it very quickly. Exactly, yeah. So they, they timed it so that the, the questions and answers were sent back before they had a chance to, uh, to send signals to each other. OK. Um, so this CHSH game is just one example of, of something more general, which is a, a non-local game. You can think about uh, games with more general questions that you can ask. Right? The x and y's don't have to be bits. They don't have to be independent. Um, and uh, you know, the answers can also be uh, non-binary. Um, you can consider more general decision predicates. So uh, a non-local game consists of some way of sampling questions x and y uh, and a decision predicate that tells you when the players, when the provers uh, succeed in this game. And given a game, you can talk about their success probability given some strategy, some correlation. And the, the different values of the game just corresponds to uh, what types of correlations are you optimizing over. Okay, so the classical value is, uh, of this game is you're optimizing uh, over all possible classical correlations. And then the quantum value, you're optimizing over all finite dimensional uh, quantum strategies. So, so these are non-local games. Uh, and now let me turn to uh, MIP star. All right, so in, in 2004, uh, Cleve, Hoyer, Toner, and Watrous, who are computer scientists uh, thinking about the interplay between complexity theory and quantum information, asked the following question, uh, what is the computational complexity of, of non-local games? So uh, to be more precise, they were thinking about the following computational problem, uh, which I'll call uh, QGAP, which stands for Quantum Game Approximation Problem. Uh, and the input to this problem is some non-local game G and a precision parameter epsilon. And the output of, that you're supposed to produce is some number alpha that approximates uh, the quantum value, omega q, of this game up, up plus or minus epsilon. Uh, and just to, you know, for those who, uh, you know, who are working complexities, sort of a technical comment, you know, what is the presentation of this non-local game G? The input is uh, some Turing machine that describes the behavior of this verifier. Okay. But, um, so you know, we have a computational problem, this QGAP problem. And if you're a complexity theorist, uh, you know, there's a number of uh, questions that immediately pop in your head. Yeah. Over all 
R yeah, so what's the... The, the, the value of the, of the game, is it asymptotic value for... Oh, uh, so here's a, a fixed game. It's, um, uh, so you can think of it as you're just given a Turing machine. Uh, on a fixed length. And a fixed length, yeah. And oh. Turing machine works out, right? right. Yeah, so why, why not just describe it as a table? Yeah, yeah so I guess... Um, you could, you know, the, the way these, you know, MIP stars sort of defined as the, the verifier is given as a, so we can think of it maybe as a circuit. Um, the verifier is uniform. It's uniform. In this in this formulation, it's uh, uh, non-uniform. Yeah, but um, um, yeah, later I'll add back in the uniformity. Right. And this is fixed for this particular problem. And there's a fixed right. distribution of question pairs and answer, and how the answer, it's like a label cover. This would be the non uniform, except the acceptance predicate is a quantum uh, measurement. Uh, oh, the acceptance predicate, um, oh, yeah, it, right, exactly. Well, the, the decision for, for whether the, the answer and uh, question pairs win is, is still some classical. Um, Computable thing. It's, it's some this D of X Y A B. Okay. Um, okay. So so we have this computational problem, um, and yeah, I think maybe the best way to think about it is just some fixed size game. You're just provided as input. Okay. Uh, and you want to ask, well, is is there an algorithm to solve this computational problem? If so, what is the fastest one? Um, maybe if you can't figure out what the fastest algorithm is, you can ask, well, suppose I could solve this problem. Uh, what other problems could I solve efficiently? Right? Or could I also reduce solving this problem to, to some, other, you know, some other computational problem? How, how does it relate? And uh, you know, in complexity theory, we can sort of formalize this, these questions in a, a nice way by considering these complexity classes. Uh, so let's think about the class uh, MIP star, which is <coughs> the class of all problems that we can efficiently reduce to this Q gap, okay. uh, and um, for some fixed epsilon. Okay. So we want to approximate uh, the, the quantum value of uh, a non-local game up to some, you know, say one half. Okay. And MIP star is going to be all the, the set of problems that we can reduce to. It. When you write that, like we're going to think of it as being in the reduction as long as fixed but always, right? You can't depend on the input. Exactly. Yes. Uh, so you you get your input and then you're just going to reduce it to some description of a novel yeah. game. That's <coughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and uh, you know the, the the reason we call it MIP star is because you know MIP stands for multiple multiple prover interactive proofs, and the star stands for the fact that we're dealing with entangled provers. Uh, and we want to ask, can we relate this, this class to other complexity classes that we're familiar with? Right? You know, P, NP, exponential time, and, and so on. Okay. So, so here's kind of a, almost a, a, a trivial statement that we can make, but um, you know, it'll sort of set up the, you know, the way that maybe we, should, we can think about how we relate MIP star to other complexity classes. So the statement is NP is contained in MIP star. We can reduce all problems in NP to, to these non-local games. So here's an NP complete problem. Is, is some Boolean formula phi satisfiable? Right. And we can transform this phi into a non-local game, G sub phi. Uh, and you know, how does this game work? Well, the verifier actually doesn't send any questions here. It's sort of a, a trivial verifier. And the prover sends some assignment. You know, just one of the provers sends an assignment to this verifier. And the verifier will accept uh, if and only if uh, the assignment satisfies this, this formula. Okay. So, so it's kind of a very you know, boring game as, as far as you know, no local games are concerned. Um, but it has this property where you know, suppose phi were satisfiable then clearly the, the quantum value of this game is one because one of the provers could just report the satisfying assignment and the verifier will accept. 
But if phi is not satisfiable, then, then there is no you know, assignment x that the prover could say that would uh, you know, satisfy this phi. So, so this is a, a reduction from you know, satisfiability to, to this Q-gap problem. And it, you know, in this case, if we could approximate the quantum value uh, of a non-local game, then we can just determine whether a formula is satisfiable or not. So, um, you know, so this gives us an indication that this Q-gap problem is not a simple problem to solve. All right, so, so now, you know, why, why are we thinking uh, MIP star? You know, where does it come from? Um, well, the, the class uh, MIP is something that's well studied in classical <laughs> complexity theory. And, uh, you know, MIP is multiple prover in, uh, interactive proofs with uh, classical provers. And another way of thinking about it, it's the class of all problems that can be efficiently reducible to uh, the problem of approximating the classical value of, of a non-local game. Right. And one of the you know, uh, gems of uh, complexity theory is this result from the 90s of Babai, Fortinal, and Lund that showed that this class MIP uh, is characterized, uh, can be characterized as all the problems that are solvable in non-deterministic uh, exponential time. Okay. So in other words, uh, solving exponential size NP problems is equivalent to approximating uh, this, uh, the classical value of non-local games. All right, so, so we have these two types of uh, classes, MIP, which is uh, classical uh, multi-prover interactive proofs, and, and MIP star, where the provers are entangled. Uh, what is the relationship between these two classes? Uh, it's not obvious. So, you know, the, the first thing you might try to argue is that maybe the classical MIP is contained in MIP star. Uh, but the issue with, you know, directly arguing this is that soundness may no longer be preserved. So, Babai, Fortnow, and Loon gave us a, a reduction saying if you took uh, an instance, an NX uh, instance, say, you know, X is the statement that some exponential size graph is three colorable. You can reduce it to a non-local game g sub x. And uh, if x is true, like if this graph is really three colorable, then the classical value of this game is 1. Otherwise, the classical value of this game is at most 1 half. Okay. So you know, but we want to say, is this also a good reduction? Does this show that uh, MIP is, is contained in MIP star? Well, for this game, what is the quantum value? Well, in the case that x is true, since the quantum value of a game is always at least the classical value, right? They, you know, the provers have access to more resources. They can win just as well, so the, the quantum value is 1. Uh, but you know, here, we, it's not clear what we can say. Right? The classical value is a half, but maybe the quantum value also jumps up to a 1, right? in which case we, we don't have a good reduction. All right, so the first breakthrough uh, in this area came in 2012. Uh, Ido and Vidic showed that MIP actually is a, a, a subset of MIP star. Um, and the way they showed this is, you know, for the games, the specific games, GX, that were constructed in this Babai, Fortnow, Lund result, the <coughs> quantum value and the classical values are approximately the same. Okay, you can't have this phenomenon where the classical value is a half, and then suddenly the, the quantum value jumps up to one. Right. And, and so, in fact, this BFL reduction from NX hard problems to non-local games uh, also shows that NX is contained in uh, MIP star. Okay, so. So what about the, the other side? What about upper bounds on MIP star? Uh, you know, is there an algorithm to solve Q gap? Okay, so we, you know, we have evidence now that Q gap is, uh, contains very difficult problems, you know, at least all problems in NX. Um, but you know, what, what is an upper bound? Um, so 
So just to compare, you know, there's a, a trivial way to get an upper bound for the, the classical version of this problem for C gap. And one way, you know, if you're given a, a, a non-local game and you want to estimate its uh, maximum success probability for classical provers, you can just exhaustively search over all prover strategies, right? Um, and this, this, you know, because you can always just imagine that the provers are deterministic, so you can just enumerate over all possible responses of, of the provers. You can always do this in doubly exponential time, and this shows that MIP is contained in doubly exponential time, right? So this is a huge upper bound, but it's at least some upper bound. But uh, in the quantum case, this trivial algorithm, this brute force algorithm, it, it's not clear if it works, right? And uh, you know, one of the problems is that the space of prover strategies uh, is infinite, and it's infinite for two reasons. You know, one is that we're now enumerating over um, all quantum strategies, which is a continuous space, right? You have to look over um, all, you know, the space of all quantum states and all measurements. This is a continuous space. But there's another reason, sort of more uh, difficult reason for, um, for why it's infinite. It's, it's that there's no upper bound on the dimension of uh, the quantum strategies that you would need to consider, right? Uh, so it's the same as the upper bound on the dimension of psi, or? The, yeah, for, with that loss of generality. So you don't, you don't know if, you know, in order to win optimally or even approximately optimally, you know, would the provers need to share you know, one qubit or two qubits in entanglement, 100 or a million? Um, and so you wouldn't know, you know when to stop. Um, yeah? For given, is solving that problem computationally hard for a given game? Well, which? Figuring out the dimension of entanglement for a given game optimally. Ah. Um, uh, so I mean, so the final answer is that there, you know, there, it, it, you cannot even compute uh, the dimension needed. Um, so it, yeah, so it's hard. Yeah. If you knew the dimension, you could exhaustively search and find the. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So, so now we've related, you know, these, uh, you know, these non-local games to some computational problem that we're interested in. And this brings us to uh, Cyrilson's problem. Okay. So this is uh, going to be slightly different. Now we're going to talk about different models of quantum entanglement. Okay. And there's, there's two natural models. Um, one is called the tensor product model, and the other is called the commuting operator model. Um, the tensor product model is, is something that already defined. Okay. So it, it's... Uh, the set of all correlations that can be realized by finite dimensional uh, quantum states and measurements. So this is the same formula we saw before. You know, there's some finite dimension d, uh, some state, some measurements. Uh, we're going to let c sub q denote the set of all possible <coughs> correlations uh, in this model. Okay. There's another model that uh, people can, in quantum information consider, and this is the commuting operator model. And here, things are slightly different. So before, uh, just to go back, we modeled the state you know, uh, of each box as having its own well-defined state space. So this box has its own space c to the d. This box has its own space c to the d. And then when the composite space is, is the tensor product of the two spaces. In this commuting operator model, there's just one space. There's some Hilbert space, h, that describes the whole system. And the state of the whole system is some unit vector psi in this Hilbert space. And each of the boxes have their own set of measurements. These are positive operators acting on the Hilbert space. But to, to capture the notion that these two devices are causally independent, that the, their measurements don't affect each other, we insist that these operators uh, you know, AXA and BYB commute with each other for all possible X, Y, A, B. And the, this correlation is given by uh, this formula where here we don't have the tensor product of the two operators anymore, but we just multiply them. But since they commute, it doesn't matter in which order you multiply them. So is it the, the first one is a special case of this? Yes. 
Um, and because of this commutation property, we get that this uh, correlation is a non-signaling correlation. Right? There's no way for you know, this box to send a signal to this box to tell it what x is. Um, so, so this is the, you know, the commuting operator model. And um, you know, what do we know about the relationship between these two models? Well, one is uh, you know, what you just mentioned. The, the tensor product model is a special case of the commuting operator model. And you know, that's easy to see, because if you have two operators in tensor product, then they clearly commute with each other. <coughs> so, so why do people think about these uh, two models? Well, a tensor product model, this first one, it's, it's a very sort of natural, obvious way to model separated systems uh, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics and in quant quantum information. Right? You have one, one particle here, it has its own st state space, one particle here, its own state space, and take the tensor product of the two. The commuting operator model is sort of the natural setting uh, in when you're trying to come up with a, a mathematical uh, you know, foundations for quantum field theory. Okay. And so there, you're, you know, you're natively working with infinite dimensional state spaces. And you know, sort of causally independent systems uh, don't a priori have a tensor product decomposition. Right? So this notion of, of two, you, know, you have these two things that don't affect each other, and, but trying to mathematically separate those two, to factorize those two into two disjoint spaces, is not something that's easy to do, at least a priori. Okay. So they say, well, we, let's, just cons <coughs> let's just insist that the, the measurements uh, commute. All right, so, so we know that uh, one's a subset of the other. We can say something slightly stronger. We can take the closure of the first, this, uh, the finite dimensional tensor product correlations. And, you know, it's, it's a convex set of, of correlations. We can take its closure. We call it CQA. And these are all correlations that can be approximated arbitrarily well using finite dimensional correlations. Okay, so, so for everything in CQA, it's, it's some conditional probability distribution, you can find a sequence of finite dimensional ones that approximate arbitrarily well. And this, it turns out that this is still a subset of the commuting operator correlations. So, so that's uh, one thing we know. Another thing we know is that if you think about commuting operator correlations, but restrict yourselves to finite dimensions, that's the same as the tensor product model. Okay. So even though you, know, you have one Hilbert space uh, but you have finite, it's a finite dimensional Hilbert space, and you just know the operators commute, you can always map this to one where there, there's a tensor product decomposition. OK, so now I can say what Cyrilson's problem is. He asks, are these two correlation sets equal? Is the closure of the finite dimensional correlations equal to the commuting operator ones? Or equivalently, if you look at uh, a commuting operator correlations, and it might be infinite dimensional, can you always approximate it by a sequence of finite dimension uh, ones? And this is where the connection to con embedding happens. <coughs> so it was proved, actually not too long ago, maybe about 10 years ago, that Cyrilson's problem is equivalent to Kahn's uh, embedding problem. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is the connection that we use. Okay, so so I've defined these two models of correlations, and now going back to yeah. Just to be clear, that if, if the answer were positive to that question, then you c you have some exhaustive search you can make. Yeah, that's what I'll uh, explain. Yeah. So, so going back to games, right? So I, I talked about these these two different quantum uh, correlation sets. Uh, we can also define two different types of values. So there's the quantum value which we described before. That's when the the provers use finite dimensional strategies. Um, but we can also allow them to use uh, commuting operator strategies. So, so this gives us the commuting operator value, and here we're optimizing over this possibly larger set. Um, we have the following relation. The quantum value is always at, uh, at most the commuting operator value. 
And if Searleson's problem had a positive answer, if these two sets were the same, then that would mean that these really are the same uh, value for, for all possible games, right? Because they're the same correlations. All right, so, so now I'm going to describe why if Searleson's problem had a yes answer, these two models of quantum correlations were the same, then this implies an algorithm for this Q-gap problem. Okay. And this algorithm combines uh, two procedures, one called search from below and one called search from above. So what's the search from below one? This is the, exhaust, you know, the, the trivial exhaustive search uh, strategy that you might first try to do. It's an algorithm that computes a sequence, you know, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, that are increasingly better lower bounds on the finite dimensional value, the quantum value. Okay. Um, and for, for every d, this alpha d is an epsilon, so epsilon is something fixed, so fix epsilon to be, you know, 1 half or 1 tenth or something. <laughs> Alpha D is an epsilon approximation to the best D-dimensional strategy for, for your game. Okay. And, and the way you, you compute alpha D is you can search over some epsilon net over the set of all D-dimensional correlations, which you can do. And one guarantee that we have is as you increase D to infinity, it's eventually going to converge to the, the, quant, you know, the quantum value from below. Okay, so this is our search from below procedure. Now, what's the search from above? It's another algorithm that computes a sequence of beta d's that are going to be better and better upper bounds on the commuting operator value. And beta d is going to be the best upper bound on the commuting operator value that you can certify using a sum of squares of degree d polynomials in non-commuting variables. And a, a really cool fact is, is that you can actually compute this beta d using semi-definite programming. Okay. And this follows from uh, two simultaneous works, one by Navasquez, Peronio, and Seed, and then the other by Doherty, Liang, Toner, and Vayner. And uh, what they proved is that not only is beta d computable, but as you increase d to infinity, this converges to the commuting operator value. So now you can sort of see how we can put the two together to obtain uh, some algorithm to approximate the, the commuting, op you know, the, the quantum value. So if you assume Searleson's problem has a positive answer, meaning that omega q is equal to omega qc, then you just compute alpha d and beta d for all d and just wait till they come close to each other, right? So at some point, if you interleave these two procedures, these two uh, sequences are going to converge, and then you'll know you've found the right answer, assuming that omega q and omega qc are the same. And, and so I've just described this uh, possible algorithm. There's no guarantees on the convergence rate, but uh, based on what we know, we know that eventually we'll converge, okay. assuming this, this condition. OK, so, so now, you know, if, if Searleson's problem has a positive answer, we, we know that <clears throat> there's an algorithm. Um, so now let me talk about this, this other thing, RE. All right. So the halting problem, um, which we probably all know, it's you're, you're given some Turing machine, and you determine if it halts. Um, we know there's no algorithm to solve the halting problem. <clears throat> and RE is the class of all problems that are reducible to this halting problem. Uh, and one thing we know, sort of one upper bound that we, we could have uh, established earlier without any assumptions is that MIP star is contained in RE, meaning that if you could solve the halting problem, you can actually solve this Q gap problem. And, and why is that? Well, you know, consider this search from, uh, search from below procedure. You're enumerating over large and larger dimensional strategies. Uh, you don't know how far to search, but you can ask the question, uh, is there a point at which this search, uh, you know, finds a value greater than one half? Okay, uh, and if it does, then if you had the promise that the value was either one or one half, then it, if it's above one half, it must be one. Okay, so 
using, you know, using an oracle to the halting problem, you could determine this uh, and, and therefore at least do this approximation for Q gap. Okay. So, so we have this uh, uh, containment. And uh, you know, our main result is, is sort of this, this is the best possible upper bound. Okay. So we show an efficient reduction from the halting problem to Q gap. So it's some transformation that takes a Turing machine, uh, converts it to a non-local game where if, if m halts, then the quantum value of the game is 1. But if it doesn't halt, then the quantum value of the game is at most 1 half. Right? And, and this 1 half is not so important. You can pick any constant that's less than 1. Uh, so here it's going to be one because it's an upper bound. Here we don't actually have any guarantees. So, but, but you don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Right. Well, it, there there is a Turing machine yeah. for which it, it is different, but we can't. Uh, we can. It's not obvious which Turing machines have this property. Yeah. It it should be, but um, so we can we can point to a Turing machine where for which we can prove that the Q value is one half, but the Q C value is one. But if if you take an arbitrary non-halting Turing machine, we don't know how to prove this. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, 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 yeah, the table versus Turing machine thing was just to whether you're talking about NP or NX for the MIP. But now when you're running it doesn't matter, then you can just have a table. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> OK. So you know, just to retrace the, you know, the steps, you know, we, we prove MIP stars equal to RE. So that means there's no algorithm to solve Q gap. In particular, this search below, search above algorithm won't converge for, for all games. That says that Cyrilson's problem cannot have a yes answer. Right? These two correlation sets are different. Therefore, there's this negative answer to the con embedding problem. OK. All right. Um, now let me get to you know, how do we do this r reduction. Okay. All right, so, uh, so here's just some, you know, some setup. Uh, I talked about encoding Turing machines into games, uh, but it's, you know, because of that, it's useful to talk about the reverse. Uh, if you have, we want to talk about a, a Turing machine G hat that uniformly generates an infinite family of, of non-local games. And all it just means is it's a Turing machine where if you stick an N, it gives you a description of the nth game in this family. Okay. So uh, that's how we talk about a family of games. And um, for any particular game, though, uh, I want, want to think about something called an entanglement lower bound, uh, which is uh, for a fixed game and a fixed alpha, this quantity is the minimum dimension entanglement needed to achieve success probability alpha okay. in this finite dimensional um, uh, model. So as an example for CHSH, to win with probability 3 quarters, you don't need any entanglement. right? You just need a classical strategy. To obtain this cosine of pi over 2, you just need a, a two-dimensional entanglement. So that's 2. There's no way to win CHSH uh, with probability 1 with any amount of entanglement. So we just define this to be infinite. Okay. So, so here's how we, this is sort of the workhorse. This is like the main technical thing that we prove. And, and there's all sorts of like technical conditions and, and so on. And, in the formal statement, but here's the, the, the informal version. So there's some computable map compress where uh, if you give me a Turing machine G hat that specifies an infinite family of games, Gn, you give compress this Turing machine G hat. It's going to output another Turing machine F hat that specifies another family of games. And now what's the relationship between F hat and, and G hat? 
well, if, if you fix any n, if the n plus first game for g, like this original family you walked up with, if the value was 1, then f sub n has value also 1. So, And then the second thing is we relate the amount of entanglement needed to play this. Com I'm going to think of fn as the compressed game. If you want to win with probability at least a half in this compressed game, you either need dimension n entanglement or whatever entanglement is needed to play the n plus first game in, in G to win with a half. You need at, at least uh, either of these two. Okay. So, uh, any, is there any questions about uh, the statement here? Why do you call it compression? Right. So, think of it as, um, I mean, eventually what's going to turn out to be the case is that the, the runtime of f sub n is going to be much smaller than the runtime of g sub n plus 1. Uh, right, so that would uh, accomplish this, but not necessarily this. Like here, it's going to guarantee that to play Fn, you need at least n-dimensional entanglement, even if this is small. Yeah. So that yeah, this thing is the maybe the most interesting part. Okay, so so how do we use this compression theorem? Well, I'm going to define a family of games uh, G n. Uh, here's how it works. Well, so fix your favorite Turing machine, M. We want to know if M halts or not. So we're going to find a family of games based on M. So the nth game is going to run, the first thing that the verifier is going to do, it's going to run this Turing machine for n time steps. And if M halts, then the verifier is just going to accept. It's not going to even talk to the provers. But if it doesn't halt in this time, it's going to run this compression procedure on g hat. This is it's, it's some sort of self-referential statement here, but it's going to run a compression on the, the Turing machine that specifies itself. It's going to compute uh, f hat, another Turing machine, and it's going to play the game f sub n. All right, so, so let's walk through what, what's going on. What, so we want to know for what is the quantum value of g sub n. Well, we can break it up into two cases. So suppose this Turing machine M halts in, in some time t. Okay? So we can think of uh, t as being somewhere on this, this line. So for all n greater than t, the quantum value of this game is, is trivially 1. right? Because you know, after t steps, it's going to halt, then the verifier is going to accept. All right. What about for? for indices n that are less than this time bound. So m never halts here. So we automatically go to step two, and we, we play this compressed game f sub n. So the values of these two games have to be the same. Right? The value of g sub n is equal to f sub n, by definition, by the construction of this game. So, so here's g sub n, here's f sub n, and the, the two values of these, these games are the same. Let's think about uh, n equals to t minus 1. Well, if we use the compression theorem, the, the value of this f t minus 1 is going to be 1 if the value of g sub t is equal to 1. And, and so we also get that this you know, g sub t minus 1 is also equal to 1. And you can sort of see where this is going, right? Just by sort of cascading down, we can argue that for all n, the value of this game is, is equal to 1. All right. So that's the case that uh, uh, m halts in, in some time. Okay. What about the case that m never halts? This is where we use the, the other condition of the compression theorem. So since m never halts, this step 1 doesn't really matter. We can just ignore it, right? Because it, it, it never accepts. So we're, we're always playing this game f sub n. So what do we know? We know that since these games are the same for all n, the entanglement lower bounds must be the same. Okay. So now let's use our compression theorem. Right? 
the compression theorem guarantees us a lower bound on the entanglement needed to play f sub n, which is the entanglement needed to play g n plus 1. Right? But g n plus 1 is the same game as f n plus 1. And we get a bigger lower bound. And you can continue this as, as far as you want. And what we conclude is that for any integer d, the entanglement needed to play gn plus uh, gn with probability at least a half is at least d. But this is for your favorite choice of d. So in fact, uh, you know, the entanglement needed to win gn with probability half is, is infinite, uh, which in, you know, we're assuming it's using a finite dimensional strategy, so this is not possible. I mean, and this tells us that the value of this game is at most a half. So in other words, any provers that are trying to play this game in the case that m never halts, if they're trying to win as best they can, they just simply run out of entanglement to, to play, you know, play this game. Okay, so, so that's how we get this uh, uh, reduction from the halting problem to the entangled value of the game. The last step on, so right here? Yeah. So, so I guess maybe the thing to notice is these two lines are the same, right? So this quantity is lower bounded by max of n and this quantity, but it's also at least the max of n plus 1 and this quantity. And uh, <coughs> so for, for any d, we can, we can obtain uh, you know, s this lower bound. So, Okay, you got it? Okay, good. Um, good. Any other questions about uh, you know, the, how this argument works? Okay, um, yeah, so in particular in this reduction, we just transform M to the first game in this family, uh, which we have, uh, we, we know what the values are in either case. Yeah, so I, mean, I guess it's inspired by you know how you prove the halting problem is uh, is, is not um, uh, solvable. Is there a way to think a lot about it as diagonalization of some sort, or like with halting? Oh, um, I think it's clear that some self-reference has to go on, but I, yeah, I'm not sure how to phrase it as a diagonalization argument. Um, yeah, maybe there should be a way. Yeah. Um, okay. So in the last you know five minutes, I'll, I'll try to uh, you know. So clearly the magic is all happening in this uh, compression theorem, right? I mean, once you have it, it's a very powerful thing. Well, how do you actually uh, obtain this compression? Um, okay. So. You know, builds on this this uh, introspection technique of Natarajan and Wright, who who last year showed uh, a better lower bound on MIP star, better than NXP. They showed that NXP or non-deterministic doubly exponential time is uh, contained in MIP star, uh, and just very you know roughly like at a very very high level, what's going on in this in this introspection? So the verifier in this compressed game F sub n, it wants to play g n plus one. But it just doesn't have enough time. So, you know, it wants to. So, how does it do it? Well, you know, just as you know, in sort of a cartoon, you know, here's the verifier in Fn. It's interrogating these two uh, provers. Uh, you know, imagine the provers are actually very far apart. Um, <laughs> it says, you know, I'm too lazy to ask you the questions in Gn plus one, right? Because, so, you know, instead, I want you to to ask yourselves the questions that I would have asked you in g n plus 1, answer those questions yourselves, and on top of that, quickly prove to me that I would have accepted your answers. And <laughs> you know, so uh, 
it's kind of a crazy thing to ask, um, but uh, it's, it's possible to actually do this sort of delegation of this, you know, this protocol uh, by using a combination of this uh, classical and, and quantum low degree test to, to force, to essentially check that these two provers are doing what this lazy verifier wanted the, the provers to do. And, and so the, the word, you know, the reason it's called introspection is because instead of the verifier asking the provers questions, it says, you know, why don't you generate the questions yourselves, you know, introspectively ask yourselves and generate the answers for them, uh, and then prove to me that uh, I would have accepted those questions and answers that you, you generated. Well, yeah, I mean, well, it's it's. I mean, it's not just similar, but in fact, it uses uh, you know PCP. And, and I guess maybe one way to think about it is in PCP, you can do this compression once, you know, from an ex, from exponential to polynomial. But there's kind of a, a bottleneck. Why can't you compress it more times? And maybe one reason is is because you you run out of randomness to to check anything bigger than an exponentially long proof. But using these quantum tests you can actually certify more than an exponential amount of, you can certify more than a polynomial amount of randomness and use that additional randomness that the provers generated to do this proof checking. So, uh, so that's a, simply one possible way to, to look at it. Um, okay, so, so now in the last two minutes, I'll, I'll mention what this classical and quantum low degree tests are. So the, the first you know, thing that really makes this work is very, very efficient tests for entanglement. So the CHSH game that we started off with, it's a, it's a simple test and it, you play this game. If they're winning very well, you know they're sharing two-dimensional entanglement. Um, but to do this compression, we need a game where you certify very high dimensional entanglement using very short amount of questions. And the quantum low degree test is something that achieves this. And it's really this amazing thing Fix an epsilon, so epsilon is just some sufficiently small constant, and a family of games Q sub n. The quantum value of this game is 1. The question and answer alphabet sizes of this game are quasi-polynomial in n for, for every n. But the lower bound to, to win with probability 1 minus epsilon, right, so think of this as 99%, for any n is at least 2 to the n. And it's the fact that this number is smaller than this number is, is what gives you huge savings. Okay. The, the question and answer alphabets are smaller than the certified dimension. Okay. So you know, by, by asking these few questions, you can certify the, the provers are using this amount of entanglement. And using that amount of entanglement, they can generate questions for a larger game. Um, and uh, what goes on behind the, the, the quantum low degree test, actually it's this classical low degree test that's really powering it. Um, so yeah, so I'm sort of out of time, um, but th those are really the two main ingredients. Um, and yeah, maybe I'll just uh, stop here. Yeah.